Saturday the 10th. It's about quarter to five. Still got some snow on the ground. What I want to show you is that I am preparing to operate the telescope. At 150X, I had to remove the half Barlow, which changed the focal length of the scope, which caused the visual back to obtrude to the point where I was afraid it was going to strike this shelving here. So I had to completely reposition the mount. You can see some the original circles here. Later on, I moved the, shifted the mount that way, but then it started uh, striking up against the roof tri there. So I had to shift everything back about an inch and a half to two inches towards the entrance door to Penti the observatory. Meanwhile, we have a spectacular sky shaping up and I'm going to institute on the uh, I'm going to institute another uh, project because I'm going to have to wait till next year to be able to continue in sequence the NGC uh, series as mentioned in the previous video. And now I do have to realign and maybe possibly remodel the scope, although I'm hoping that I've got it in a good position. So that will be my project for this evening. And then I will launch into the NGC 1600 to 1650 group, which I had done on a really excellent night, but it was later in the evening, so it couldn't be included sequentially. The result of which I will have some nice comparison because there were some excellent galaxies to be imaged 1600 to 1650 on a very superb night of seeing. I'm hoping I'll have a similar kind of night tonight, and that way I can compare the two millimeter exit pupil views to those that are at one millimeter or 150 compared to 75x. Back in, it is quite cold. Okay, it's Saturday night the 10th of February. I'm about to kick off a new series in the NGC catalog and Messier catalog. Basically, the idea is going to be I'm going to operate at one millimeter exit pupil, 150 uh, millimeter ED uh, refractor. We're operating at 150x, which is based on the idea that the best views you get of both detail and brightness in any scope by compromising detail and brightness for magnification, etc., etc., is at one millimeter exit pupil which basically is a magnification equal to the aperture of the scope in millimeters. What you're seeing on the screen right now is Messier 1 in Taurus. And, but for the purposes of this evening, all I'm doing is baselining the image so you can see it. Uh, we'll probably have a look at a few other things as well towards the end of the evening. But what we're really going to feature is a series of studies, mostly galaxies, in the NGC catalog, beginning with NGC 1600 to 1649, that I have already imaged using the 75x 2mm exit pupil setting. I expect to lose about a magnitude and a half, but I expect, hope to see more extended detail. The night sky is very decent but I do want to do a comparo between the 75X on this Galaxy series in particular and the 150 to get a sense of how at higher magnification using the same settings on the Rev2 Imager affects uh, depth in terms of luminosity and detail in terms of texture on galaxies. We're going to look at all the NGC 1600-1649 series this evening, if possible, compare it to a previous study on a very good night of seeing for the same studies, and then, but the only difference is going to be the magnification, and we're going to be able to draw some conclusions from that. So, let's get started. What you're looking at now is Messi A1, a supernova remnant of a star that exploded in 1054 AD as documented, noted and documented by Asiatic, Chinese and Japanese observers of the time.
Tonight could prove to be a botch job, and the reason I say that is I discovered after removing the half power Barlow in the uh, diagonal in the Rev2 assembly that the focus extended outward and could possibly collide with the work envelope of the observatory. So I had to completely reposition the mount, which meant I lost all the really excellent settings I had, mechanical and model settings that were tracking so well. This could become super critical primarily because at 150x we got a very small field of view and it's not really clear to me where things will turn up in that field of view. What we should be seeing here is NGC 1600 a galaxy in Eridanus, magnitude 10.9, 3.1 by 2.2 arc minutes, an elliptical class 2, so a football shaped elliptical galaxy 209 million light years distant. We're at minus 5 degrees with a right ascension of 4 hour, 31 minute, and 39 second. And frankly, I am not seeing anything of the galaxy in the field. There is a bit of a splotch right there, it's not very well centered. I may very well have to spend most of this evening realigning the mount without being able to really clearly characterize what 150X does in terms of detail, surface brightness, and galaxy reach with the 150 Skywatcher refractor using the Rev2 system at 128 flood and 42 decibels of sensitivity. There's our look at what should be a magnitude 10.9 but largest to 3.1 by 2.2 magnitude NGC 1600 which is five degrees below the celestial equator. I do believe that is the galaxy there. I would have to speculate about that, however. I will center it up a little bit, uh, but I don't want to necessarily synchronize to it because it could be erroneous. So let's move on. What we should be seeing here, hopefully, is NGC 1601, another galaxy in Eridanus, not far from where 1600 was. It's fainter, magnitude 13.8, 0.6 by 0.3 arc minute lenticular spiral, 222 million light years distant. And we've hardly shifted much from our previous galaxy, and I am personally not seeing anything on the screen, so I'm rather doubting that we are synchronizing which means I'm probably going to run the scope over to Rigel and see where it turns up. And when I do so, I will let you see where it is after I redo the alignment slight, model slightly. Okay, we're seriously being impacted by the mechanical realignments I had to do, plus the new modeling. What you're seeing there is Rigel, but Rigel wasn't even on the 7 by 10 arc minute screen at the time of my attempt to go there and synchronize the scope. Also, my weight just shifted on the floor of the observatory, shifting Rigel's position. So what I'm going to do now is make the leap back to 1600 and see if that corrects, if we can actually turn something up right about where the disk of Rigel, first magnitude Rigel, is on the screen right now. Okay, I made the leap to NGC 1601. You can see the galaxy right there. So at least it did track pretty well going from Rigel to er in Orion to Eridanus. What I'm gonna do now is go ahead and see if we also can turn up the la larger, brighter galaxy, NGC 1600. Well, I type that in, allow this image to form on the screen. And as I mentioned, there was hardly any movement of the mount. So what I'm going to do is just let you watch it make the leap. So I'm going to 1600. Okay, there was a slight shift in the stellar positions to the left. I'll give you data on NG 1600 as it forms on the screen. I will, of course, have to play with mechanical alignments again at some point with the mount. 
I did spend about a half an hour on it earlier this evening. Um, it took, it can take several outings before the model, the mechanical alignments of the azimuth and the declination all pretty much have things nailed. Now let me tell you about NGC 1600, Galaxy and Everdanis. Magnitude 10.9, 3.1 by 2.2 arc minutes, elliptical of class 2, 209 million light years distant. We're at minus 5 degrees, and the only galaxy I'm seeing on the screen is this one here, and I cannot be sure that that wasn't 1601. However, it is fairly bright. It's possible that 1601 is this fainter uh, uh, nebulosity over there. So what I'm going to do now is push on to 16.02 and we'll, actually 16.02 isn't accessible, 16.03 and we'll see what we turn up there. Okay, I've dialed in NGC 16.03, it wasn't too far from 16.00 and 16.01. Another galaxy in Eridanus, magnitude 13.8, 8 by 0.5 arc minute lenticular spiral class O. 228 million light years distant. Now normally when I'm doing these higher magnification images I was not going to uh, image anything fainter than magnitude 13.0 but tonight I want to do a whole bunch of current comparisons to the same series of galaxy under very good conditions that uh, I already have posted up uh, under the night sky quest for 1600 to 1649 and I will be pulling images off that and comparing them with these. There is a brightish galaxy right about there. I do not know whether or not what that is. There are some faint fuzzies also in these locations as well. So what we're going to have to do is get a sense of how well we're tracking as we go through this series and if I have to reproduce all this after doing mechanical alignments on the scope and remodeling the Lossman D electronics, then I will have to do so. So, okay, now we're on to NGC 1604, another galaxy in Eridanus. This is the faintest one so far and should be right on the limits of what's possible at 150x. I am seeing a faint spudgy area there. 1604 is a galaxy of magnitude 14.5, 1 by 0.7 arc minute lenticular spiral, 202 million light years distant. It's at minus 5 and almost a half degrees in declination and I do believe we can see the galaxy right there which means that we are at least picking out 14.5 magnitude galaxies with an average surface brightness of roughly magnitude 14 at 150x. And as predicted in my Mathematica Galactica a couple of weeks back, this is roughly the equivalent of the results you might get through a 12-inch telescope operating at um, two millimeter exit pupil. In this case, we're operating at one, but we're also enhancing the luminosity using a CCD image, real-time CCD imaging system that's using six stacks at a relatively high sensitivity and long exposure time to render the images on the screen, making them visible to anybody who happens to be watching this video. Now we're off to NGC 1606. You don't expect to see this galaxy in Eridanus. It's magnitude 17, but its small size means its brightness is going to be fairly intense. I also believe that its magnitude 17 is based on blue-violet, which means it's actually a 16th magnitude, roughly a 16th magnitude galaxy. NGC 1606 is a spiral with a bar, lenticular class A, so it's a half step removed from a lenticular Z equals zero. We're at minus five, a little bit more than minus five degrees in declination, and I am seeing a couple of faint fuzzies right there. Hard to tell whether or not that's actually our galaxy, but we will go ahead and file this away for comparison to the 75x views that we've done previously.
Well, we may actually have to do another synchronization or at least another star in the model because things that I'm seeing here tending, tending to be towards the top when hopefully we would actually see our galaxies about there, but there is a faint one right there. So I'm not sure yet. I haven't really got a good sense of how accurate we are yet. As you see, 1607 is a galaxy in Eridanus, magnitude 15, one by 0.4 arc minute size spiral with a lowercase a. Probably got a round core once removed from Z, which is the lenticulars, 190 million light years distant. We're at four, minus four and a half degrees in declination. And I'd be surprised if we were to pick out anything of a 15th magnitude galaxy. But once again, this could actually be a magnitude 14 galaxy visual. But there is something faint in these regions here. So let's push on so we get a better sense of how this is going to work. Okay, I just did a centering on Aldebaran. As you recall, Rigel was somewhere around here. Aldebaran slightly to the left. What I'm going to do is I am going to go ahead and center it up and then uh, redo the model slightly electronically without doing anything mechanically. And then hopefully we'll get a better, we'll have a better sense of where the galaxy should turn up on the screen. So here we go. Just, uh, I'll, I'll turn the camera back on once I've managed to synchronize or align to Aldabrin once again. Okay, I've repositioned and realigned to Aldabrin. We'll go back to NGC 1608 and see how that works out for us. As you recall, Aldabrin centered up right about there. That doesn't necessarily mean the model is very accurate. What we hope to be seeing here is NGC 1608, Galaxy and Taurus. It's also NGC 1593. Magnitude 13.4, 1.6 by 0.6, arc minute size, lenticular spiral, 167 million light years distant, and we're just about a half degree above the celestial equator, so we're in the middle third of the sky, and all I'm really seeing here uh, are instances of this sort of thing here, which are marginal, but that does kind of, well, it's also got a star next to it. Anyway, so we'll have to inspect the images tomorrow and compare them slightly to the 75X images, which could be complicated in terms of being able to do it, primarily because I believe the scope was flipped equatorially looking to the west when I did that series, so that complications. NGC 1609 should be somewhere on the screen, except it's magnitude 15. Galaxy in Eridanus, magnitude 15, 1.1 by 0.7 arc minutes. Spiral of, uh, with a core and a lowercase a, 192 million light years distance, minus four and almost a half degree. I cannot tell you for sure, but there appears to be a very faint core of a galaxy right about there on the screen. Now you'll notice one thing you want to pay attention to is how the screen flux of, of luminosity changes with declination. Um, typically in the middle third of the sky you see lots of stars, you have a nice reasonably flat screen with a radiant that's brighter towards the top and darker to the bottom. However, this region in here gives the highest contrast views. Moving on. What I'm still hoping to get here is some kind of definitive view of a galaxy so that we can have confidence that we're actually turning them up. This next galaxy is NGC 1610 in Eridanus. It's also 1619. Smallish, 0.6 by 0.4 arc minutes, 207 million light years distance, and almost minus five in declination. In general, I do not wish to ordinary at 150x image anything further south than minus 10 degrees. I may break that rule tonight because we're simply trying to characterize the performance under these circumstances. This 1610, by the way, is magnitude 16.1. We would not ordinarily expect to image it on the screen, but there does appear to be a bright core right about there. But careful as I shift my weight to see these things, I am actually disturbing the quality of the image. So I have to do something about that.
What I'm hoping we're going to see is some hints of NGC 1611, a galaxy in Eridanus, magnitude 15, but largish and more edge-on, 2 by 0.6 arc minutes. Spiral with a lowercase a, 190 million light years distant, a little uh, further south than 4 degrees. We're at right ascension 4, 33 minutes and 5 seconds. I'm hoping we're getting an image on the screen. I cannot lean forward to check it out. I'll have to see the actual camera. Handycam uh, imaging tomorrow, be able to see whether or not we've actually turned this one up. But magnitude 15 is right on the limit for 150x. Our next catch, hopefully, is NGC 1612, a galaxy in Eridanus. Magnitude 15 again, but a little bit larger, 1.3 by 1 arc minute. Spiral with a lowercase a, 219 million light years distant. I'm not sure if it's turning up, but I'm seeing trails on the screen, which means my weight may have shifted slightly. I am going to get to look up the next galaxy, giving this one a chance to actually formulate. And then I'm going to press the record off button now. NGC 1613 is another galaxy in Eridanus, magnitude 15, 1 by 0.8 arc minutes, spiral with a lowercase a, 200 million light years distant. We're at minus 4 and change in declination. I will go ahead and progress to the next galaxy, which should be brighter, magnitude 12.9. Let's see where this one turns up on the screen after we go there. Okay, I'm hoping this one will turn up. This would be in the range of what I expect to look for in galaxies in the future once we characterize the optical and recording performances. It is NGC 1614, a galaxy in Eridanus. It's within minus 10 degrees. It's at minus eight and a half of the celestial equator. It's magnitude 12.9, which puts it one-tenth of magnitude less than my my uh, somewhat loosely defined limit of magnitude 13.0 and brighter. The galaxy is 1.3 by 1.2 arc minute spiral with a bar with some peculiarities. Now one of the reasons why we're doing these higher magnifications is we want to be able to image these peculiarities because the uh, imager should give almost one arc minute, uh, one arc second of resolution for each pixel. This galaxy is 212 million light years distant. So hopefully it is somewhere on the screen and it is showing some hints of that peculiarity that is mentioned. NGC 1615 is further north, almost 20 degrees. So we'll have a sense of how the sky position is affecting both the tracking and the image quality. It's a galaxy in Taurus, magnitude 13.6, so a little over the top in terms of brightness. 1.2 by 0.8 arc minute lenticular spiral, 153 million light years distant. We're a right ascension, 4 hour, 36 minute, and 1 second. And I cannot tell you whether or not that galaxy is on the screen. I'm thinking off angle that maybe it's there, but I cannot be sure because I do not want to shift my body to get a better view at 150x. That is more doubled in terms of its effect on the image and the ability of the image stacking to work successfully. And you see 1618 is another galaxy in Eridanus. This one's minus three and change in declination. It falls within my parameters for future views if it actually works out. Magnitude 12.7, nicely sized 2.4 by 0.8 arc minute, 4 to 1, 3 to 1 uh, aspected uh, galaxy, spiral with a bar, lowercase b, twice removed from lenticular, 218 million light years distant. And I am hoping this one will show something of that bar in this image.
For those of you who are new to real-time imaging, stars tend to pop out pretty quickly on the screen. Galaxies t typically take 25 to 30 seconds to begin to reveal themselves, and you can watch them be painted slowly on the screen as the CCD imager makes six passes of about two and a half seconds each. There's also image stabilization time, which usually means that we don't get the fully finalized image until about 25 seconds into it. Now, I have no effect, idea what effect uh, operating at twice the magnification will have in terms of image stabilization. That's something we'll want to look at when we look at this series of videos on the manana. By the way, that last galaxy was a duplicate. I believe it was 1619 and 1606, but I can't be sure about that. So it'll be interesting after doing the alignments where it will have turned up on the two screens. As you see, 1620 is a galaxy in Eridanus. Magnitude 12.3, 2.9 by 1 arc minute, spiral with a lowercase c, 157 million light years distant. We're just below the celestial equator in terms of declination. I'm hoping this baby will turn up and show its lovely face. DC 1621 is also 1626. It's a galaxy in Eridanus, magnitude 14.5, so it's on the bubble for being able to be detected at 2 millimeter exit pupil magnification. It's 1.4 by 0.8 arc minute size elliptical galaxy, 199 million light years distant. We're almost at minus 5 degrees in declination. So this particular galaxy would be on, as like, once again, another one of those galaxies that's on the limit of detection using the current magnification and the Rev2 imager. This should be a significant galaxy to look at. NGC 1622 is another galaxy in Eridanus. It's only minus three and change in declination, so not in too bad a position in the sky. It's a 12.5 magnitude galaxy with a great aspect ratio of 3.7 to 7, which is about five or six to, six, five to one. Spiral with a bar and a lowercase ab, 216 million light years distant. Due to its sky position, its magnitude, and its apparent size, this would be almost an ideal galaxy to be able to reveal something of the usefulness of operating at higher magnifications. I won't be able to tell much about it until I look at the imaging tomorrow. Well, this could explain why we're not getting very good centering. Once again, I've recentered on Rigel, and it's way to the top of the screen. Pretty clear that the scope mechanics and model is going to have to be redone on the manana. I think I'm going to have another good sky tomorrow night. I am going to center up once again on Rigel and see if we can improve our accuracy for the rest of the galaxies. Having centered up on Rigel and re-upping the model slightly, I've returned to Aldabra and that's where it turned up. I'm going to set her up on it one more time and then we're going to go off to our next galaxy in the study. I believe it was 1623 or 4. NGC 1625 is a galaxy in Eridanus, magnitude 12.3, 2.1 by 0.5 arc minute spiral with a bar in lowercase b. 212 million light years distant. We're at minus 3 and change in declination. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and check to see what the next galaxy is. This was the next one, 20, 1626, was also 1621, so we're going to move on from that. Uh, there's another galaxy, 1627, it's magnitude 13, let's make that hot. I got two bars left on the Handycam, battery-wise. NGC 1627 is a galaxy in Eridanus. Boy, there's a lot of galaxies flowing down that river. Magnitude 13, largest 1.6 by 1.6. Spy spiral with a, a lowercase c, three times removed from lenticulars on the Hubble de Vaucularis. 172 million light years distant. We're at almost minus five degrees. I am, this would be a galaxy right on the limits of magnitude for normal use at 150x. But, tonight we be characterizing. Skipping a few galaxies because they were fainter and then lower. I 
Headed up north a little bit to Taurus, NGC 1633, a galaxy, magnitude 13.5, almost face on, 1 by 0.9 arc minute, so it has an average surface brightness at a 75x of 13 point, probably 13, yeah, 13.5 magnitude, but we're now operating 150, so really its average surface brightness would be magnitude 15. Galaxy is a spiral with a bar and an abs, uh, with a lowercase ab. 219 million light years. We're at plus seven uh, change degrees in declination. I sure hope the galaxy is somewhere on that screen, given its magnitude of 13.5 and average surface brightness. NGC 1633 had a neighbor in NGC 1634, hardly a tick on the Lozman D. Mount. Galaxy and Taurus, once again, magnitude 14.1, but small, 0.4 by 0.3 arc minutes. So its light would have been spread out to the equivalent of 0.8 by 0.6 arc minutes. It's a lenticular spiral, 204 million light years distant. We're at plus seven and change degrees in declination, with still with two bars left on the handicap. Well, at least now I'm getting a good view of the screen right in front of me. We're off to NGC 1637, a galaxy in Eridanus. It's supposed to be magnitude 10.8, largest 3.9 by 3.3 arc minute spiral with a bar in lowercase c, a mere 33 million light years distant, at almost minus 3 degrees in declination. However, I'm not seeing anything on the screen, despite the fact the sky is quite nice up there. It's giving a good view, even though it's incredibly cold. So we're going to have to make the leap to Rigel or Aldabaran first to see what our alignment is before we can go much further. But that's a fairly intense, possibly a galactic core right now there. But the whole reason for doing this is to be able to see uh, the extensions of galaxies. A bar, for instance and uh, extended luminosity, and I'm not seeing any of that there. Let's go ahead and check Aldabaran's and the screen position. Well, let's have a look with one bar left on the camera for our final view of the evening. What might be considered a disappointing evening, but it's not surprising we had so many issues given I had to completely, I had to reconfigure the optical train, which changed the work envelope in terms of focus which created the opportunity for possible collisions with the observatory wall and the mechanical changes I had to make to accommodate that. So here's our view of Messier 43, the conch shell. Notice its location on the screen. I had Aldabaran up here. It gravitated to that position there for the center of the nebulosity. So I got some work ahead of me and it took quite a while to perfect the alignments last time. They ultimately did turn out to be very, very good, both to the east and to the west. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do Carpe Noctem. I'm gonna go in and thaw my hands, um, and I will inspect some of the images on the morrow and see if anything of value came out of it whatsoever. Carpe Noctem.